Well, it was quite a remarkable piece of programming that um, I'm going to follow Ed with. Oh, those lights are bright. Um, we only spoke for the first time yesterday, but uh, there's quite a lot of similarities between uh, that sort of macro story that, uh, that Ed talked about and um, a more sort of localized uh, implementation of that uh, that I'm going to talk about, including quotes from Vern Harris. So I'll just rip into it. Um, if you're wondering about the title, um, that's the Vern Harris link. Um, in 2001, South African archival practitioner and scholar Vern Harris uh, gave a keynote presentation at the Conference of the Archives and Records Association of New Zealand. Um, Vern is an archival hero, um, they do exist, um, and a social justice activist. In his keynote, uh, Vern took us through the well-known power dynamic of the archive, and by archive I mean any collection. He used the metaphors of voice and silence, of seeing and blindness, to encourage discourse on the archive as a social space, and therefore a space of tension and struggle a space of little consensus. So collections have voices, he said. They never speak to us as things in and of themselves. They speak to us through the specificities of particular power relations and social dynamics. Every collecting decision is an act of remembering or forgetting, depending on what those decisions, uh, depending on whether the decision is to collect or not. Vern's call to New Zealand archivists was to listen to the silences in their collections, to be an activist of deconstruction rather than an advocate of truth. I quote, archivists of deconstruction know that every move they make is a construction of knowledge and an exercise of power. They feel compelled, compelled to disclose their complicity in these constructions and exercises. Of crucial importance, they are bound by the principle of hospitality to otherness. They respect every other invite every other in. So in that, uh, so um, it's irrespective, uh, irrespective of whether uh, they're collecting, describing, or making records available, they listen intently to the voices of those who are marginalized or excluded by prevailing relations of power in the archive. And without knowing what Courtney was going to talk about, I think that kind of, um, she gave a really excellent sort of exemplification of that sort of receptiveness to the other. So, um, like Courtney, I want to emphasize that this is not a new issue, that many institutions and memory sector professionals have been responding accordingly in the last 20 years or so. Um, so I'm not going to go into great detail of this, otherwise it would turn into a talk about archival theory. And that's a threat. <laughs> but I invite you to uh, think about the voices and silences in the digital memory of your institution, in your practice, or that you've come across while trying to access and use the digital collections in New Zealand. And while you're doing that, I'll present you with a really brief update of the New Zealand web archive through a similar lens. Uh, here's an overview of the digital collections at the National Library of New Zealand as at the 31st of December, 2012. Um, it's a, a total of stuff that's in the, in the National Digital Heritage Archive. Not all of our digital stuff is in there yet. Um, but we've got over just, just over a million uh, items, and in some ways the, the, num the item count is a, bit, is a bit irrelevant. An item could be a database, or an item could be a single photo. So it's a blunt categorization used for the purpose of overview, and to emphasize, emphasize a couple of points. Um, archive websites currently only make up 1% of the digital collections. It just shows that it's still a really boutique component of the overall collecting activity of the Turnbull Library and the National Library which is also a little bit misleading, the 1%, because we're still yet to ingest three whole of domain harvests and our GeoCities copy that we've got at the National Library of New Zealand as well. Um, so whether you count them as one object or millions of objects, you can see the sort of disparity of the numbers. But web archiving is still boutique, that's the point. Um, given the, oh, the dominance of serials is, around, is about papers past. Uh, given, the, given the number of years the library has been digitizing collections, the unpublished born digital items, so manuscripts, photographs, oral histories, ephemera, etc., are holding their own pretty well and appear to be slowly increasing their percentage. It's not quite the digital tsunamis that many commentators are so fearful of yet. Um, and my colleague Kirsty Cox talked about um, our experiences of, of archiving unpublished born digital stuff yesterday. 
Um, speaking of yesterday, Penny mentioned the significance um, of the investment in the digital preservation system at the National Library of New Zealand. I'd just like to emphasise that it's only through acts of collecting and preserving that things can be made accessible, uh, born digital things can be made accessible. And the point here is that the act of collecting uh, of an increasing number of born digital collections, including websites, is the result of having this digital preservation capacity and capability. A lot of people did and continue to do a lot of good work here. It's, a, it's significance on the landscape of the New Zealand memory sector cannot be overstated, I don't think. And as Ed said, digital preservation is access in the future. Um, so there's just some numbers, um, uh, an overview of uh, the numbers of uh, websites that we have collected in the last sort of four years. Um, We've been responding to the sort of change of, of uh, we've been responding to the web archiving challenge by collecting websites since, since 1999. However, the numbers here are from 2008. There's two important things happened. That was the first release of the National Digital Heritage Archive. And that's when the regulations came in to support the e-legal deposit um, uh, change in the legislation from the 2006 National Library of New Zealand Act. And Ed talked about um, the limitations in the Library of Congress around collecting websites and having to ask permission. Um, the legislation changes means we don't have to ask permission. Uh, we can essentially take. <clears throat> Please note that by a website, I mean the public website, the HTML files that uh, presents a page and its contents to the users including other documents uploaded on the site, such as PDF files or MP3s, etc. Uh, this isn't a talk about how we collect the web, but it's worth mentioning that the library exclusively uses an open source piece of software called the Web Curator Tool. The National Library of New Zealand uh, developed the Web Curator Tool in collaboration with the British Library and the, Internet, uh, the International Internet Preservation Consortium that Ed talked about. And here's just a snap of its uh, SourceForge page. It's an open source tool. I'm not going to go in the interest of time into too much detail about that. Um, there are two primary approaches to web archiving. There's selective harvesting, for which we exclusively use the Web Curator tool. It's sort of people selecting URLs, programming them into the tool, um, scheduling when they get harvested. A harvester goes out and pulls the file, brings it back into our systems. We do some uh, QA and then ingest it into the archive. That's pretty much the workflow. It sounds really simple, but it's kind of not. Um, yeah, so there are two primary approaches to web archiving. Selective harvesting, for which we use the Web Curator tool, and bulk harvesting. So bulk harvesting is intended to capture a snapshot of an entire domain which is everything from, in our, in our case, which is everything from a New Zealand-based server within the .nz domain or selected international sites with significant content from New Zealanders. Uh, the National Library currently runs these as biennial, biennial projects, which we contract out to the Internet Archive in the US. We collect a lot of stuff this way. We started the whole domain web program in 2008 and have then harvested 105 million URLs at four terabytes. We followed it up in 2010 and harvested 130 million URL, URLs at eight terabytes. We recently completed the 2013 harvest, uh, which is about 190 million URLs at about 11 terabytes. Uh, these data sets are pretty big by the standards of uh, an infrastructure of our sector. Um, we can store them safely and perform a search on behalf of a researcher if they're interested. But generally they're too big, um, not that scary, I just like the slide, um, to provide any meaningful access to them at this stage. But one day this temporary silence will be uh, ended. Uh, but despite the seemingly catch-all approach, it's still sporadic and selective harvesting is still a necessity. It provides flexibility, selective harvesting, provides f flexibility to curate. It enables us to dive deeper into some websites. And critically, it enables us to respond to what may be short-lived web-based documentation of something important, like a snap election, or some earthquakes in Canterbury, or the Rena oil spill. Ed talked about the average age of a URL but he was talking about that in relation to the academic publishing sector. The average age of a URL in the sort of wide, wider wild web, I think you mentioned, 
um, is a contested measure. The Internet Archive suggests somewhere between 44 and 75 days, and the arguments rarely go past 100 days. So we have to keep a measure of selective archiving, web archiving capability alongside our catch-all approach of domain harvesting. But drilling deeper into what is collected and why, archival theorist Sue McKemish summed it up best in this book, iDigital Personal Collections in the Digital Era. She had a chapter entitled Evidence of Me in a Digital World, where she explained the increasing role of the internet as a mechanism to document and memorialize the lives of individuals, communities, families, and, in and interest groups. I think that sentence sums it up best, so I'm going to repeat it. The internet is the mechanism that is increasingly used to document the lives of individuals, communities, families, and interest groups. So naturally, the only way to capture this for the collective memory of a country like ours is via a web archiving function. With our selective web archiving program, there's a deliberate intention to collect websites that complement existing collecting priorities for unpublished collections, as well as making an intervention to give place in the national memory to those voices that don't often get a chance to speak. So we're still primarily making remembering and forgetting decisions. The themes we use around uh, uh, to select our websites from include the visual and performing arts, politics, public sector organizations, community and religious organizations, Maori organizations, online largely amateur music production, which is a whole other talk in itself and really cool. Um, protest or lobby groups and those groups and individuals who provide an alternative view to the government perspective because we've got a massive collection of government perspective of things that's called Archives New Zealand. Um, sport, environment, history, and events take a lot of our time, like the Olympics, central and local government elections, Canterbury earthquakes, and currently the web response to the centenary of the First World War, which is a project we call Lest We Forget the Remembering. So here are a few examples from outside of the government area that represent our collecting priority, priorities and our attempts to give voice to the often silenced. I'm just going to whip through them quickly. I think they speak for themselves. Uh, snapshots, by the way, we do actually collect the website. You can get in and click around and play around like it is a real website. So Paul, I think, spoke really beautifully yesterday about the uh, relationship um, uh, to, with, for Māori with memory and place and the sort of uh, the diaspora and some of the dislocation around, around place. Um, We've talked with a few uh, researchers who are um, researching on the Māori diaspora and the sense of identity um, within iwi, and the web archives of iwi, I think, are a really excellent source of information about connecting iwi with each other. This blog has changed from, um, at the start it was, the chairman's blog was totally in, um, in Chinese, and there's sort of an increasing amount of English that's coming through. Zeitgeist. The plethora of Wellington, uh, of New Zealand bands in Melbourne. This is a YouTube channel um, which offers uh, an in-depth look into a sort of, well not look, it's like a sliver, I guess, um, of uh, the South Island rap scene. <laughs> of its time. It talked about uh, the Twitter archive capability to download and um, to download your own archive and around political papers. And honestly, we hadn't talked about what we were going to talk about, but yeah, we're doing this. Um, so um, 
Yeah. That's the first one that we got. So I, I contend that through traditional collecting methods, these voices come into the official memory through diaries and letter writing, or letter writing, which often require the extraordinary circumstances of distance or separation to make the ordinary New Zealander put pen to paper, or through the personal archive, which often requires the equally extraordinary circumstance for them to remain intact for decades. The usual workflow for these voices on traditional media is that thoughts and deeds are documented, a significant period of time lapses, often decades, before by archival Darwinism, or an occasional targeted intervention, they managed to make their way into the collections of the memory sector. The collecting the web changes this paradigm. What I'm probably laboring to emphasize is that the web is the place that gives voice to those we don't normally hear from in our memory institutions. It's the great democratizer. And the web archive provides an experience of what these individuals, organizations, and communities were saying in the context in which they were saying it. At the National Library of New Zealand, we do our best to respond to these silence, but we're still just a couple of people within the frame and rules and tools of a single institution. We have limitations, time, money, and a lot of technical limitations, which I didn't go to, into in the first part of the, of the talk. But also we have limitations to the relationships to the voices that we, want to, that we want to document. Which brings me to a question I want to ask. The National Library Act empowers us to collect by taking anything publicly available on a website without having to ask permission. Anything from a New Zealand server within the New Zealand domain or most interestingly, well no, maybe not most interestingly, but also by a New Zealand, uh, by a New Zealand based um, New Zealander posting on a foreign website. If you're in the collecting game, and that's most of us here representing institutions, that's a pretty cool function and mandate. So many institutions represented here are indeed in the collecting or memory building game, with many now going through their second or third or fourth phase of reshaping or recalibrating themselves for the digital present. Here's a couple of recent commitments that got me thinking. This is from the Auckland City Library Strategic Plan, who seek to capture the new stories of a diverse Auckland. Here's from the Te Papa Strategic Priorities page, which articulates their commitment to reflect New Zealand identities past, present, and future. So I believe the National Library of New Zealand Act and the web archiving function and, and the ecology of the memory sector forces us as a sector to address this question. If the new stories of a diverse Auckland community that the Auckland City Library wants to document and the present and future identities of, that Te Papa want to reflect are increasingly, and I acknowledge it's not exclusively, communicating and documenting themselves via the internet, then what is the role of the capacity, capability, mandate and collections of the New Zealand Web Archive? Please note that I only highlight those two institutions because I gave a version of this talk at Auckland City Library um, in May and because I'm here in this place. The size or place of your institution is irrelevant. The silence reflected by what you want to collect that's on the web, but can't or don't know how, is relevant. The Web Archive mandate capacity and capability is an opportunity for the New Zealand memory sector to coordinate, and dare I say, possibly even collaborate even more, especially if it's to effectively use its increasingly tight resources. And I'm not just talking money here. I also mean the necessary skills to ensure the adequate documentation of New Zealand's often silenced communities. Or that the web voice of the communities that the sector as a whole wants to reflect are not silenced. So please, if you're interested, then the Web Archive team, represented here by Gillian Lee and Susanna Joe, and because it's dark, I won't make them stand up, uh, would be very happy to hear from you. We may have already collected what complements your collection, where our priorities and intentions may overlap. And if we haven't, and they don't, then I'm confident we'll have an interesting time coming up with a solution. Uh, Penny talked yesterday about the value of the uniquely Kiwi way of collaborating. Um, so I'm not talking about MOUs or anything here, I'm talking about getting in touch and talking about things you want to document on the web and having a conversation about how we can maybe make that happen. So really briefly, because um, the uh, strobe light of the flashlight app of Matt is sort of um, telling me time's up. I've got a couple of points to make about access and use. 
Check out these three collection items, the Securities Commission of New Zealand, their websites, the Royal Commission on Auckland Governance, and the Bioethics Council of New Zealand. What do you think they've all got in common? Well, they're all government websites. They're all no longer live websites. But the main thing about these three items is that they are the top three uh, items in the list of things most accessed, uh, accessed in uh, the National Library collections, which I said really poorly. They are heavy hitters. <laughs> um, <laughs> I did have a whole lot about numbers, but um, I think as Simon pointed out properly yesterday, the numbers are meaningless. Um, but they're important if you want to get people's attention, um, but they're actually meaningless in terms of um, representing impact. So I'm not going to go into them. But there's thousands, three collection items in 2012, thousands. Um, looking at these collection items as instruments of deconstruction, I contend that they're, they're yelling at, at us, and here's what they're saying. And if I was reading uh, with my nephews, I'd put on the voice of a website at the moment, but I won't. Just imagine it in your head. <laughs> I think the analytics are telling us that these thousands of hits are coming from the live web. They're completely missing the catalog, the traditional value add that a library, archive, or museum has. Coming straight from the live web. Hmm. And they're mainly coming to us uh, from the, uh, well, a lot of them are coming to us from the education sector, from law, uh, law and economic schools. So if your, if your value was around education and the balanced value impact model, that would be a high score there or have high impact if that was one of the values you held, held dear. I think they're also telling um, us that um, they're wanted soon after creation, so don't leave them lying about. All of these organizations are government agencies. The records being used to create these websites, so the content that people are looking for, will probably go all into the government archive. Eventually, they'll be made available to researchers through the normal challenges of the uh, normal channels of the continuum of the public record. In some cases, that will be soon, but in most cases, that will be about 15 to 30 years. However, there's clearly real benefit in providing access to quality content as soon as it's no longer publicly available to the researcher. They also say something about the relationship between the, gov the, the collecting of the gov government websites to the public record, which I've got a screed of information about because I used to work there, but I won't go into that. Um, so it is through listening to these combined statements, the relationship between the live web and the archive web, and a glimpse into the demand for collection soon after they're created, that I want to make my last point on the possibilities for access to the archive web from, web from the live web without the catalog intervention. Using a personal principle I often adhere to in my professional practice called getting the hell out of the way. Uh, here's a tool that the Internet, uh, International Internet Preservation Consortia are working on at the moment, uh, or have worked on. It's called Memento, and it's basically like adding a temporal dimension to the live web. Um, it's a plugin for Firefox or Chrome, um, and I've, I've, I've circled this sort of toolbar at the, at, at the top. There's the current National Library of New Zealand website. Um, and quite simply, by scrolling along that bar, you go back in time, and it's a protocol that pulls the website uh, to the, from the internet archive from the ne sort of nearest date that you have identified. So there's plenty of documentation online about Memento if you want to explore it. I recommend you just use it in your browser. So it just kind of puts a temporal layer on the, on the live web So it's completely ignoring the catalog. It's putting our content where other people are, which is something that I think Deborah talked about quite well this morning. Um, so we're looking at currently making our, our web archives uh, compatible for Memento. So currently, if you do it, it will pull from the Internet Archive in the US. Uh, so to conclude, um, the intention of this paper was to provide a general update on the New Zealand Web Archive uh, to stimulate some thinking and discussion on, on the role of the Web Archive um, as a mechanism to give voice to silences that often exist with our official, within our official memory, and to highlight some of the possibilities of the mandate, capacity, and capability 
of the New Zealand Web Archive at the National Library of New Zealand within the ecology of the memory, memory sector to stimulate some coordination or collaboration on giving voice to the other and to those uh, others that you're wanting to reflect in your institution as well. Uh, which is another way of saying we've got web stuff, you, if you've got web stuff you want to ensure is being collected and preserved for your stakeholders or that complement your collections, then give us a call. Thanks.